welcome from BWCD and good afternoon everyone is today's session. Um, I'm Sharmata Bishti, work with CLEAN as a campaign officer. To our respected speaker, Petra Jal, talk about role of Asian Development Bank and Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, AIIB. I hope this session will be very helpful to understand the investment in our country and we will be able to relate our previous session with this session. Uh, before going to our session, I want to introduce our speaker, Petra Jal. Petra Jal is a campaign manager. She joined re Recourse in March uh, 2018 till now. Before this session, she worked with the uh, B, uh, Bank Information Center and as a program manager uh, at Betron Wood Project. Uh, for over five years, where she uh, coordinated the work on environment, human rights, and social impact. She has previously worked at, at organization uh, New Economic Foundation, the World Development Movement, focusing on social and environmental issues, including sustainable and equitable water uh, resources management and climate change. She also had all, uh, spent one year working in Tanzania for con uh, conservation organization. Uh, Petra holds an MSc in de uh, Development Studies from SOS, University of London, a BSc Social Science from University of Stockholm, Sweden, and uh, in Environmental Sustainability from University of London. May I now request you, ma'am, for this session? This microphone is yours for next one hour. Ma'am. Thank you. Thank you very much for that introduction and really excited to be back and uh, yeah, uh, provide um, some information on the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. So I, I did a presentation to the previous uh, students in March, I think. So it's really exciting to meet the next lot. Um, hopefully it won't be just me talking for the whole hour. Um, I'll do a presentation um, talking about the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. I'm going to give a little bit of an outline on what it is, um, what does it lend to, what does that mean for Bangladesh, how does it engage in Bangladesh, um, and then talk a little bit about, well, what's the next steps? How can you engage with the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank? What are the key opportunities coming up? Um, so hopefully it'll be clear enough. And I'm going to try and share my screen now. So hopefully that's going to work. Um, and please do let me know if you can't, um, if anything that I'm saying is too fast or complicated or um yeah any questions you have um but i'm gonna start now um please shout if you can't see my screen now yes it's okay great super <clears throat> so yeah so the asian infrastructure investment bank energy in bangladesh is is the key theme so I was going to start a little bit just giving you an overview of the AAIB, which is not as well known, I guess, as the Asian Infrastructure, in the, um, sorry, the Asian Development Bank um, and the World Bank, um, who you may already have had some lectures on. Um, AIB is a bit newer and it was set up in 2016 um, and it's a China initiated bank. Um, it came out with quite a strong mandate to be lean, clean and green um, when it was set up, uh, launched January 2016. Um, it's grown quite rapidly over these past six years. It's now have 104 member countries. Um, and from starting off just in Asia, it's now expanded all the way to Latin America, um, so it's no longer an Asia-specific bank, but actually it invests um, in other countries as well um, across the world. China remains the largest shareholders. Um, it has over a quarter of the votes. Um, and after that, you've got India, Russia and Germany. 
Um, Bangladesh also has a seat on the board, um, but together as part of a constituency, which is actually leading at the moment. Uh, other countries are Malaysia, Maldives, Nepal, Philippines and Thailand. So they jointly um, engage at the board level. Um, so I'm based in London um, and Europe is actually quite an important uh, player in the AIB. Um, European countries joined the bank uh, early on um, and European representation um, actually covers about a quarter or almost a quarter of voting power um, divided into two constituencies. Um, so if you remember that China has over a quarter of the votes, Europe actually together has almost as much, uh, which means for me sitting in Europe, it's actually quite important to be involved and engaged. Um, it's quite important to know as well that the US and Japan are not members. <clears throat> and if you've learned about the ADB already, you will know that ADB is led by um, Japan and US. So when AIB was set up, I think they felt that there was very much in conflict with the Asian Development Bank and chose not to engage. But a lot of the other members are, are part of both. Um, they're actually hosting their annual meetings right now. It was supposed to be in the Middle East. So that's another area where they invest. Um, and it concludes today virtually. So let's look at the portfolio. So as you will see here, they invest in, in quite a broad, diverse um, area of uh, different sectors. Um, and I, I don't really know. Yeah, I'm not sure if you can see my, my marker now, but here you have energy and actually it's 20%, so about a fifth of the portfolio. The biggest share of AIB's investment is to date in energy. Um, it's approved 147 project as of today, uh, worth 29 billion. Uh, so it's still not huge, but it has ramped up um, investments in the past couple of years and it's almost as much um, committed 21.4 billion committed in, in in projects and programs so moving on from there let me see oops I've gotten stuck there we go so coming to the main topic that you're working on which is energy and I'm sure climate as well um, it's interesting to note that the AIB was launched just after the Paris Agreement on Climate Change, which was approved in December 2015. Um, and you can see that in some of the rhetoric, um, what AIB you know, proclaims to be. So it aims to be green and it does reference the Paris Agreement in several policies and strategies. Um, it's in fact a member of the MDB, so the Multilateral Development Bank Working Group on Paris Alignment. Um, and they this week they committed to align to the Paris Agreement by 1st of July 2023. Um, so it's done a lot of uh, big statements on, on Paris Alignment in particular. Um, they also have several shareholders. Yeah, yeah, look at the Europeans in particular who have quite strong climate policies and the UK recently committed to not fund fossil fuels overseas. Um, we've seen them breaking this policy already, but, but there are some commitments. And President Jin has repeatedly stated, um, th so this is the AIB's president, that he will not fund coal. So I've added a couple of, of statements he's made. Um, but actually, in reality, if we look at the facts of what AIB does, um, in contrast to what it says it will do, um, he hasn't really put Ma'am, you are not audible. Yeah. 
think somehow across internet is found now. Petra, are you here us? Sir, she disconnect her, you said. Please have a contact. अच्छा अब रेक्ट शो माय नीचे मैंने शायद कांट्रैक्ट कुटी से हमरा एक तो शोमाय लग गए जी अच्छा समस्या नहीं है एक तो आप इक्का करता है चले नेट के प्रॉब्लम है तो तो ओके आप बोल समस्या नहीं अपना हैंडल करें Hi there, I am so sorry. Oh no, it's uh, okay. <laughs> my Wi-Fi went completely black and I've 
tried to do everything. It doesn't normally happen, so it's typical. Um, so I'll, I'll jump straight back in and I do apologize and hopefully it won't happen again and I'll try and speed up so we get through everything. Uh, let me try and share my screen again. Let's see. Oops. Right. So uh, going back to where I, I was, I was just going to outline a couple of um, things that explains how, while the AIB says it does things on climate uh, and on energy, um, it doesn't do so in practice. So in terms of the, so I mentioned that it doesn't have a clear plan in terms of how it will make sure it doesn't uh, aggravate climate change. It also doesn't have any clear guidance to staff, even when they do mention the Paris Agreement in some policies and strategies. And the new corporate strategy that came into um, effect for us of this year, it does commit to 50% climate finance approvals. So 50% of the project approved uh, from 2025 should be climate finance. Um, but th there's kind of two problems there. One is that the corporate strategy doesn't mention anything on, on fossil fuels and the fact that actually to achieve this, you need to get out of fossil fuels. And also what they cl um, classify as climate finance is very broad and its classifications, all the MDBs use, and it, it's, it includes a lot of things that we might not call climate finance. The energy sector strategy is one of the most controversial things. So they approved this in 2017, but it actually allows investments in all fossil fuels, including coal. And I'll get back to that a bit later. Um, the new environmental and social framework was approved this year, and that's the safeguards for all uh, projects that they need to comply with um, in short terms. So there's some complications there, but um, but while it does include some language on climate change, um, it, none of that is necessarily mandatory and it's not strong either. Um, and I'm just showing here um, a little list we did last year. Um, so one of these have been updated. Um, how you can see on the different elements that the Paris Agreement could um, would mean in practice, the AIB has a kind of red uh, flag on all of them, or a red traffic light. So looking at the AIB's energy portfolio then, what are we talking about? Um, so yes, yeah, you can see, um, which is also clear from the fact uh, that the rhetoric says AIB is green, the practice says that it doesn't really mean anything in terms of their policies, and when we look at portfolio, we can see that there's a clear line going through there that um, AIB is not Paris lined, um, and you can see that in terms of the big biggest share here of the energy portfolio is towards fossil fuel. So almost double um, the amount of the renewables. Um, and when we talk about renewables here as well, it's obviously important to note that um, AIB, um, like other MDBs, classifies renewables in the kind of broader sense of the term. So there are projects in there that we may not uh, deem sustainable in other ways, like large solar plants and also uh, geothermal that can have issues and, and hydropower, obviously. So even that figure, if, if we were looking at the kind of projects we would like to see, might actually need to be cut down more. And then we have energy other, and a lot of that is transmission and, and distribution projects. So we don't always know what um, type of fossil fuel that supports. So, and it's also important to note that this, um, the energy portfolio doesn't include, uh, as I've mapped it out here, other types of funding. So uh, a big share of AIB's portfolio is funding through financial intermediaries. So this is when AIB invests in, say, a bank or an infrastructure fund, um, and then that bank or infrastructure fund um, invests in something else. And we have seen examples how that something else uh, can be um, gas, it can be oil, it can even be coal. 
So looking at this, uh, breaking it down a bit further, like I mentioned previously, um, if you look on the right hand side, that's the renewables. So you see that most of it is actually hydro, which um, can be very problematic as well. Um, small share of wind, geothermal, um, and then the, the second largest chunk is towards solar. In terms of fossil fuels, so everything is gas. Um, so AIB has been true to at least what the president has said that we won't invest in coal, but it has invested a lot in gas. So it's gas distribution, gas storage, and, and also greenfield gas. So moving on to Bangladesh. Um, so AIB has invested 2.6 billion in Bangladesh since um, inception in 2016. Um, and as you can see here, that energy represents almost a quarter. In fact, when we looked at the energy portfolio two years ago, everything, uh, sorry, at Bangladesh portfolio two years ago, everything was energy. But in the past couple of years, they've also added um, a few more other types of projects. Um, and obviously, in the past year, COVID lending has um, appeared and increased. So these are the projects that um, AIB has invested in since uh, 2016. Um, in, in terms of the energy portfolio. So that represents 605 million. Um, and they're all in the kind of higher environmental and social classification. So A and B projects, most of them grid projects, but we also have um, the Greenfield uh, Bola IPP plant, which I'll come back to and I'll give another example as well. Um, this is what's in the portfolio now. Um, it's another transmission uh, project. Um, and there's also, it's actually two transmission projects, um, quite significant, one A and one B, but it's, there's quite a lot of money in here. So it's actually almost as much as AIB is invested today, it will invest again in Bangladesh if these projects get approval. Um, so looking at the type of um, energy investments that AIB has done. Um, well, I think as you've already noticed, um, there's no renewable energy whatsoever. Um, and also in the planned projects, there's no renewables, um, which obviously is, is quite questionable for Bangladesh as a climate vulnerable country. Why is the AIB then, um, as it claims it wants to be Paris line, it wants to be green, why is it not investing in in renewables at all. Um, so some of it is fossil fuels, uh, but most of it is, is uh, transmission and, and distribution um, mixed. Um, so we don't know exactly what it will support. Um, this figure as well, or these percentages, so this is by value, um, excludes financial intermediaries, which I mentioned earlier. So previously, when we looked at AIB two years ago, um, AIB also had an investment in Summit Power through um, a fund called the I IFC Emerging Asia Fund. And when we looked at that investment in Summit, we obviously saw lots of links to gas and oil plants, as I'm sure you're all aware. Um, AIB has now exited that investment, so it's no longer in the portfolio. Um, but that shows how financial, it's important to look at financial intermediaries as well to understand um, the impact of an MDV like AIB. Um, and obviously, while it was investing in some, it, um, it helped that company um, elevate and increase its, its gas and oil portfolio. So looking at Bola specifically, um, so Clean has done a lot of work on, on Bola and is much better placed to talk about this than I am, and also the Bangladeshi Working Group um, on External Debt. Uh, but this is, yeah, for those who haven't been there, um, this is the Bola IPP plant. Um, so I was privileged enough to visit this uh, plant or this area, speaking to communities. Uh, two years ago when I went to Bangladesh. So this is a 220 megawatt greenfield dual fuel gas and diesel combined cycle power plant. Um, the project that AIB has invested in also includes a five kilometer pipeline to a gas field. 
This was in, um, approved in 2018, or the AIB's investment was, um, and part of a bigger project. It was labeled category B, and this is quite controversial. So this means category A is the kind of strictest environmental standards that the AIB will apply. Category B is, is the kind of a limited number of potentially adverse environmental and social impacts that they foresee. Um, but when CLEAN and the Bangladeshi Working Group um, looked into this, they found a number of different issues. Um, there was lack of consultation and poor information. Trans for example, translations were faulty, and there was lots of misunderstandings um, regarding two different power plants as well amongst communities. Landowners were pressurized to sell at a low price, uh, up to five times less than legally required. There was no compensation for grazing land, and that, of course, affects women in particular. There was noise pollution from construction and concerns for operational phase. Um, pollution and damage to the local tidal canal as well, um, which is quite significant because this has really had an impact on livelihoods in the area and also for women as well in terms of uh, being able to use, use the, the canal for various um, household, um, um, yeah, for the household. Uh, it causes flooding, damaging crops, including bit beta leaf production. And that's also been noted by diversity impacts, including significant reduction in fish species. So this is just a, a little snapshot. And there's a video link here um, you can have a look at that and your forum on ADB has put together. Um, just to note on this now that um, this project has potentially been sold. Uh, so we don't know exactly what the status is any longer with AIB. Um, but but it's definitely a quite a significant, very, very problematic project in Bangladesh. Um, the next one I'm just going to touch upon briefly is the power systems upgrade and expansion project. So this is a transmission and distribution line, uh, which is over here, the chattogram link. Um, so this is the map from the, the um, overall um, power plant plant for Bangladesh. So this is about, in, from the outskirts, it looks like it's about increasing regional power load in this particular area. This uh, loan was approved in 2019 for 120 million. Um, and it's quite interesting here as well, because it wasn't actually approved by the board. It was approved by the president, which he is entitled to do when there are already similar projects in the country. Um, so this is problematic with the Airb as well and how it operates. Um, so it covers three parts in this chattogram link. Um, again, uh, Airb classified it as category B, claiming that there was only be temporary disruptions. Um, and it claims to promote electric electricity for all, but when you look at a project documentation, they're actually only really looking to get as much money out of it as possible and does not talk about access for the poor. Um, there's also lots of other additional issues which I haven't listed here because CLEAN has done even further research into it and found that consultations were very poor and faulty and there were a number of other issues. Um, and I'll point you shortly to where you can find out that information. Um, but also what the project documentation doesn't clarify is where does this power come from? Um, but if you look, look at the, the links over here, you can immediately see that these um, places that are pinpointed here actually go to coal areas. So we're actually seeing how this, um, this new investment by AIB um, actually will be fed by coal power. So to find out more, because I'm just kind of speedily going through this, um, there are two reports in particular you can look at. Uh, there's actually quite a few more on Bola specifically as well. Um, but um, the first one here to the left, which we also have in, in Bengali, is, uh, was done two years ago, which mapped out all the energy investments at the time. And then a new report was launched um, just a few weeks back, um, and that looks at Bola in particular and this other project as well, and, and also some other 
um, kind of consideration regarding Bangladesh specifically from an AIB perspective. So really recommend you to have a look at those. So what next then? What do we need to do uh, in terms of engaging with the AIB? So we're kind of stepping away a little bit from Bangladesh now and going back to AIB as an institution. So I mentioned previously that AIB doesn't have a clear plan for how it will align with the Paris Agreement. Um, so from our side, we will continue for AIB to call on them to do this. Um, it needs to have a clear timeline, it needs to have deadlines, it needs to have targets. We need to see that from them because we don't understand how they will be green if they don't uh, clarify how they will do it. Um, the other thing that I touched upon earlier is the 2017 energy sector strategy. Um, and that one, after much pressure, will finally be reviewed in, in next year. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, that policy or this strategy um, allows for any type of fossil fuel. So it's obviously a really prime opportunity to make sure that they finally um, move forward and, and start phasing out fossil fuels. The other thing which I guess is relevant on a country level, and so I'm coming back to Bangladesh and where you are, it's obviously really important for civil society on the ground to monitor what's happening with these AIB projects. So CLEAN and the Bangladeshi Working Group on External Debt um, is doing a stellar job on, on this in Bangladesh. Um, so I'd really encourage you again to read the reports they've been doing and also engage and flag to them projects you might spot that have problems so monitoring both the implementation of the AIB's uh, energy projects and also the pipeline. Um, and for us as City in Europe, that's also really important information because when we engage with our shareholders, um, we are very happy to raise these issues um, so that they can be raised at board levels and at times stop projects or challenge them and, and change them. Um, I also wanted to mention that there is a mechanism. So all MDBs have accountability mechanisms and so has the AIB. It's called the Project Affected Peoples Mechanism, which in theory means that if communities um, experience problems with AIB invested projects, then they can raise them. There's unfortunately a lot of caveats with this because the AIB is limiting um, access to this mechanism to projects where they don't have a co-finance it. Um, and they also put up a number of other barriers. And we're at the moment trying to challenge these barriers to make this mechanism more accessible, but it's still worth knowing that it is there um, and that we should try and use it if we can, if we come across violations um, against communities impacted by projects. So moving on to this. So I just wanted to give you a little bit to, to wrap up, to look at the energy sector strategy review a little bit closer. So this is really an important opportunity to engage. And we're really hoping to hear a lot of voices from um, communities and civil society and, and academics and, and so on and so forth um, as AIB opens up this review. So we don't actually know that much what will happen just yet. The board meeting um, to discuss the review and most likely agree on a plan forward is happening in December. And then the review itself uh, will be starting in 2022. So this is what we know so far, but there's nothing pub publicized yet. So we, we have heard from shareholders that there will be a public consultation, but we haven't heard much more. So what will the timeline be? What will the outreach be? Um, and so on and, and so on. So we, we really don't know a lot of detail, but we will certainly keep on top of it and uh, try and ensure that the consultation is as open and transparent as possible. So, um, but to kind of kickstart the discussion about the energy strategy we launched together with NGO Forum on ADB, so we as recalls, uh, just a little bit of a teaser of what do we want to see? How do we want AIB to, to change their energy strategy? And as part of the context for this, um, 
if you have listened to uh, information on ADB already, or if you will um, in the, the kind of next, in um, uh, another one of these lectures, then you will be aware or will become aware that the ADB has just approved a new policy. Um, and we are not happy with that one. It is weak um, it has some, some promising detail, but a lot of it is, is not not to the standard we expected to see. So we want to get in early now and make sure that the AIB knows that that's not how we want to see um, this energy strategy going um, and outline a couple of uh, key issues we want to see. So the first one is simply stop funding coal um, because coal is already uh, allowed in the current energy sector strategy. Um, and this is actually where ADB has taken a step forward. It has in its new strategy explicitly uh, said that it will exclude coal power. We want this to go even further to ensure that it includes all types of coal investments. Um, but I'll come back to that. Um, then gas. Um, I'm sure you've already talked a lot about gas on this course. Um, and I'm sure you're aware of all the reasons why gas is not sustainable. Um, but unfortunately, we still see that MDBs keep uh, using gas as a transition fuel and using that rhetoric. And the same happens with AIB. Uh, but we really, really want them to move away from this rhetoric and, and start looking at what the recommendations are from the International Energy Agency even um, and put that into the new policy. Then we want to make sure they close all the fossil fuel loopholes. Um, so I mentioned financial intermediaries earlier, how a financial intermediary invested in Summit Power, um, which all of a sudden meant that they were investing in, in not just gas, but also oil. So we want all these loopholes to be closed. Um, and that also includes things like industrial use of coal. We want to see that phased out. Uh, then, of course, ramping up support for sustainable renewables, and we really wanted to emphasize sustainable here because not all renewables are sustainable. Um, so we want to make sure that, yes, they ramp this up, but also um, really considering what type of renewables they're investing in. Um, energy access for all is a really important thing for us, and I think as well, um, as a multilateral development bank, so not just a bank, a development bank, um, there needs to be um, effort to reach the poorest and the most vulnerable, um, and therefore energy access uh, for all must be front and centre, not through fossil fuels, but through, again, sustainable renewables. Then no full solutions. And here we're talking about all the different ways of carbon capture and um, waste to energy and so on and so forth, large scale dams uh, that can be presented as being sustainable. Um, we want to point out that these are dead ends that may not lead to um, the goal where we want to come to. Um, and AIB shouldn't waste its resources and capacity towards those solutions, but should instead focus on the, the solutions that we already know of. Um, put gender equality front and center. Um, so I'm sure you are well aware of, of this narrative as well, um, that women in particular are often most uh, harshly impacted by climate change due to, in particular in poor communities where women are responsible for water and fuel and the, the kind of livelihood for the family, the household, um, food provision. And all of these are hit by climate change particularly bad. Um, so those considerations need to be taken into the energy strategy. And then you look at, at energy per se, that renewable energy and, and distributed energy can help women in particular uh, with making sure that they have access to light, which can help them um, in terms of redistribution of their, their work tasks and also provide security. Um, and women may also have a role in terms of the workforce, <clears throat> excuse me, for rolling out renewable energy access. So, so there's lots of reasons for why the energy 
the strategy also need to put gender issues up front. Then a rights-based approach, meaningful participation. There's obviously lots of other vulnerable groups um, that needs to be uh, taken into consideration when you look at the energy solutions to make sure that they work for them. So you have the right to free prior and informed consent for indigenous people um, and also yeah, the other, other vulnerable groups and making sure that participation is front and center as well, um, that people have an opportunity to input and um, come forth with, with their ideas. Um, and this also goes for the energy sector strategy review uh, itself that we need to make sure that the consultation is open, transparent and, and accessible to all. Then supporting a just transition, because as we move away from fossil fuels, um, obviously there will be workers that will be, um, you know, have invested their career into the fossil fuel industry, um, and a lot of those will be poor workers as well, so we need to make sure that there's opportunities for them um, and that the transition out of the fossil fuel industry is just. And then finally, set ambitions, transparent and accountable targets. So we want to know what exactly, where does the AIRB want to go? They need to spell that out so that we can engage with it and understand um, where they need to go. So it needs to be things like um, greenhouse gas um, reduction targets and monitoring. Um, that needs to be, yeah, all sorts of things. Um, energy access target, renewable energy targets for sustainable renewable energy. I talked about genders. So we need to see that they are really monitoring gender and have targets for that. Um, so a number of different things. So as you will hear, I'm skimming through a lot of the detail on this. So um, do have a look at our, our little briefing and there's a little bit more in there, but this is very much the beginning of the conversation. So we wanted to put out these T10 um, issues now as the bank is meeting for its annual meeting and before they meet as a board um, so that we later on can have a more, can develop these further and add other points to this list and um, as we um, move into the consultation phase. Finally, um, I'll wrap up there. I'm really sorry about the delay um, and hopefully we'll have a little bit of time for questions. Uh, this final question is, uh, sorry, this final picture is from Luxembourg when um, the AIB last time met, met physically for its annual meeting, when we all stood up outside and challenged their track record on climate change and dirty energy. So thank you very much uh, for your attention. I hope it was useful and uh, yeah, look forward to your questions for clarification or comments or ideas. Uh, thank you much for giving your valuable insights on AIV in the energy sector of government. Especially I like your skin and strategy in the energy sector. Okay, so, uh, so with that, we will go ahead and take some time for questions. So, if you have a question, you can ask that box to ask for the question. Hey, how are you doing? Yes, I'm doing it. How are you doing it? Yes, I'm doing it. Yes, I'm doing it. Okay, we've already seen you. Shamil, can you unmute your question? Shamil, can you unmute your question? Okay, uh, ma'am, I have a few questions actually. So my question is, who are these people uh, in AIB uh, approving these projects? And who are the people who made the Paris Agreement in first place? Because if they're working together, uh, but uh, they're not going on the right path and their works contradicts each other policies. And my second question is, uh, is AIB not under any supervision? And if it's yes, then why they're not doing by fundings in this uh, fossil fuels? Is AIB... Uh, it's capitalism after all everyone wants to get richer 
So shall I give it, I actually didn't hear the last part of your question. I heard the first part, but it, it cut out. Maybe that was what you were discussing. But maybe just to respond to the first one then first. So in terms of who are approving the projects, so multilateral development banks um, are formed up of members um, who take decisions. So those are the shareholders. And those shareholders are countries. So when I explained earlier that, for example, the Europeans have a big uh, role in the AIB, it is as decision maker and approval for them to approve these projects. Um, so the board comes together uh, with all the different member countries um, almost every other week right now to approve projects. And this is also why it's important to us as because this is obviously this is public money. So if you look at me from um, the UK, so I pay tax here and that tax goes into the public, you know, um, bag of, of funds or whatever we may want to call it. Um, and then that's used in different ways. So when the UK then goes and sits on the AIB's board um, and have contributed to AIB, then I want to know what they do with that money. And if they invested in fossil fuels, then I'm obviously unhappy. So that's why we have we are as civil society here engaged with the UK to push them to not approve fossil fuel projects, for example. But for various reasons, these projects go through anyway because other countries have different views. Um, and, and, and that's where I guess the policies come in and become important as guidelines for how the board can act, what can they approve, what projects can be put forward to the board for approval. And that's why we feel the energy sector strategy is important to engage on, because if the energy sector strategy says very clearly you cannot invest in coal, you cannot invest in gas and oil, then the board will have to accept that. Uh, but at the moment it says no such thing. Um, so we may need to try and influence that. Um, so, so yeah, that's kind of a very shorthand way of explaining how, how the board works. But as I also mentioned that at some times the board isn't actually even um, involved. And that's something we tried to challenge previously, um, but haven't really gotten far enough on. So one of the projects I mentioned earlier was actually approved by the president and not by the board. The board will have seen the project documentation, but they approved it themselves. And in terms of supervision, that's something where, again, civil society who are uh, closer to the communities are impacted and um, to help them um, monitor these projects is really important because the AIB itself, it's supposed to supervise them um, and they do get reports back, but I would question how rigorous that is and whether we get the right information all the time. Um, as an example, I've engaged a lot on a project in, in Myanmar, previous to the coup, obviously, um, where the information the AIB had versus the information we had was quite different. And I think the same has happened on BOLA as well, that there's, there's a big gap in terms of what information is being fielded back to the AIB versus what um, you know, communities feel, that consultations isn't happening. They're not doing the surveys they're supposed to be doing or doing them in a bad way. So, so yeah, that's kind of a shorthand, but feel free to ask any follow-up questions okay i'm good, just going to read the second question here um yeah, well, in uh in the chat box here i actually second part of the question okay i yeah yes so so yeah in terms of supervision so so yes that, that's kind of the supervision as it has it's the board um and and the fact that the board isn't acting properly um, or that the board has actually interpret Paris alignment in a different way than we do. So that's why we constantly need to challenge them. Um, 
and make sure that the policies are stronger so we have more backing for challenging them. Um, and by funding in fossil fuels, is Airbnb benefiting financially? Um, I mean, it is a bank. It does um, have interest. It's normally quite low interest. Um, and I would suppose that they are looking for investments that are beneficial. Um, and yes, yeah, yeah, I agree with you. Everyone wants to get richer and that's that's part of it. Um, and I think the countries as well who put forward these projects play a part in that too. So it's important to understand that the kind of link between the ARB and the country governments as well. Um, the country governments do have a role in terms of, in the, and I'm talking now about the, the countries that access the funding. So Bangladesh, the government in Bangladesh, the government in, in other countries that um, benefit from these loans. Um, if the government keeps putting forward projects that aren't necessarily into interest of the people, then that's also a problem. Um, and I think there is behind the scenes probably a fair bit of nepotism and uh, potential corruption going on. Um, yeah, so yeah, it's, it's not a perfect system as well. And, and yeah, they're, they're in it for, for their own benefits. I hope this answer your question. Uh, Shabir Bhai, I want to have your question in Uttar Pegasin. Yes, ma'am, thank you. Are there any questions? Yes, ma'am. So I can see another question now. If AIB stops investing on coal-based plants and like this, then what would the impact on day laborers to workers on the coal side? Is there any substitution plan for them and people like them? So, I mean, this is a very topical question, which is often labeled the just transition. So that was something that we, we put in this um, briefing that I showed you earlier. Uh, we have a point on, on, so this one, on just transition. So, and, and that is a really important point because there's a lot of poor workers in particular who will be impacted. And I think the day laborers which you bring in is particularly impacted because they often miss out. And that's actually a really good point that we need to bring into um, the discussion when we start engaging properly on, on the new energy sector strategy. Um, so just transition basically means that we want to make sure that no one is left behind. So no one that is currently um, very much linked into the kind of economy around fossil fuels and coal based plants, for example, don't lose out in the transition to renewable energy, but that there's a, a kind of safety net for them. Um, and that it's very fair um, and it, that it, um, you know, thinks about all the different types of laborers and how they can either transition to work within renewable energy or whether there's other ways that they can be supported um, if they lose their jobs because a coal plant, for example, shuts down. So that, that there's a very ongoing and, and live discussion on that. Um, so, so yeah, it, thank you for raising that topic because it's a really, really important one. Thank you, Will. And just to actually add a little bit on that. So on AIB, they don't have that policy yet. Um, but in the ADB, who just approved their energy policy, they have actually introduced some language on a just transition. Um, it's not perfect, so we hope with the ARB that we can, again, make sure they recognise a just transition, but then makes it, make it stronger than what the Asian Development Bank has made it. Uh, we have come to the end of our session. I would like to thank everyone who made this session possible. And I thank everyone. A special thank you, ma'am. Uh, may I want your permission for closing the session? <laughs> Absolutely. And I just wanted to thank everyone for, for joining. And again, really sorry for the break in my internet. That was 
yeah, typical. It doesn't normally happen, but it has happened today. But it's been a real pleasure to be able to share some information on AIB. And thank you for your questions as well. And also feel free to email me if you have any further questions. I'd be very happy to, to respond to anything or engage in any other way that's helpful. Oh, thank you, ma'am. Okay, thank you, Petra. Thank you for your cooperation. <laughs> okay, uh, next time we'll see you and meet you again. Thank you.